today we're going to explore conduction. And we're going to be do, do this by a problem that's fairly standard uh, when you're dealing with thermal condu conduction. And so this is the problem. We assume that there's a wall that's made of a layer of wood, which is this brown stuff over here, uh, that has a thickness of 10 centimeters and a thermal conductivity of 0.2 watts per meter Kelvin. And it's covered in a layer of ice, this stuff right here, having a thickness of one centimeter and a thermal conductivity of two watts per meter Kelvin. And what we're going to try to answer is if the outside temperature is minus 10 Celsius and the inside temperature is around room temperature, so 25 Celsius, what is the rate that heat is transmitted through a one square meter area of the wall? And so in general, we know that heat is going to go from hot to cold, but we want to explore that a little bit further. So before we get into the problem, I'd like to talk a little bit about what conduction actually is. And so we know that heat is equal to the motion of atoms. In other words, heat in an object is just the atoms in the object vibrating around and interacting with each other. And we know from our expression for the uh, relationship between the temperature and the average kinetic energy in an ideal gas that the temperature goes as the velocity squared. And more specifically, in a solid, the, uh, we know that 3 kBT is 1 half mv squared. And you might be asking yourself right now, why is it 3 kBT instead of 3 halves kBT? And the reason why is that this expression for the energy in an individual atom is 3 halves kBT in an ideal gas. However, in a solid, there are, bound, uh, there are uh, bonds between uh, neighboring atoms, and so in each direction you have not just kinetic energy, so let's just take a look at one of these. You have not just kinetic energy in one direction, you also have potential energy, and so that gives us more degrees of freedom, so it raises the energy per atom. And so that's where we get this 3, halves, uh, three kBT instead of 3 halves kBT is equal to the mean kinetic energy. And so what we can do here is think about what's going on in a solid. And so if we think about it in terms of the motion of atoms, then what's going to happen is, let's just say for the sake of argument, I put a flame over here. And this is my uh, terrible picture of a flame. And so what's going to happen is that the atoms that are right next to the flame are going to start vibrating, and they're going to be vibrating a lot. And not only that, they're going to be vibrating a lot, uh, and a lot more than the ones that are directly adjacent to them. And so the atoms in this layer are going to transmit some of that kinetic energy to the atoms in this layer. And so these ones are going to start vibrating around too. And it's random motion, it's thermal motion, that means that it's in all directions, and it's going to move all over the place. And then similarly, now all of the stuff over here on the left is warmer than on the, uh, you know, there, and so it's going to happen. And so heat is going to sort of generally propagate in this direction, from higher to colder, because what's happening is atoms that are near the heat source move faster and jostle into the ones next to them more and raise their average kinetic energy and do the same thing through the entire object um, and that's how heat gets transmitted. And so you can think of conduction as being the diffusion of heat through an object and that's exactly what it is. It's the diffusion of heat from the hotter part of an object to the colder part of an object by atoms just jostling into each other. And in fact, we can take that expression, uh, this idea, and write it down as an equation. And that equation is Fourier's law. And Fourier's law just states that the change in energy with time, or more accurately, the energy transmitted through some surface as a function of time, which we write as just dq dt, is just equal to k, which is equal to the thermal conductivity of the substance that we're worried about, times A, which is the area, times dt dx, which is the temperature gradient. And all the temperature gradient is is the change in temperature as a function of position. And what that tells me is 
if my temperature changes very rapidly over some space, then heat is going to transfer very efficiently. And if there's very little difference in temperature from place to place, heat is going to transport very slowly. And coming back to this thermal conductivity, it's important to note that this is a this strongly depends on the material that our you know the, the what, on the material properties, and so it can change by orders of magnitude depending on whether you're talking about something that's a very good uh, uh, a very good conductor of heat, such as copper, and a very poor conductor of heat, such as air or wood or something like that. So. Now that we've got uh, that out of the way, let's get back to the problem. So, using the understanding that we've just gained uh, from our discussion of thermal uh, conduction, what we can do is look at this problem again. And so, what we see is that we have um, an inner temperature that is hotter than, an outer te uh, than the outer temperature. And what we'll expect then is that heat will flow from hot to cold. And so it's going to flow out. And it's going to flow through not just the wood, but also through the ice. And so if you think about it, we think that the, the total amount of heat that's input on this side of the wall, we could call it Q in, has to be equal to the heat that goes out. And we could think of it as this as Q out. And the reason for that is that if you put more substance or more heat in on the hot side than you take out on the cold side, then whatever you have in the center here is going to get hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter. And that doesn't make sense from an equilibrium standpoint because as it gets hotter in here, then what it does is it raises the temperature, the rate at which heat flows out this way. And similarly, if it gets colder and colder in here, then it's going to reduce the rate at which temperature flows. And so in equilibrium, if we called this, uh, this substance 1 and this substance 2, we can say that in equilibrium, dq1 dt, which is to say the rate at which heat flows through time with substance 1, in this case wood, is just going to be equal to dq2 dt, the rate it with which heat flows through substance 2. And now that we know that, we can solve this problem. So the first thing we have to do is think about this expression. So we know that dq1 dt is equal to dq2 dt. And I can write that in a much more precise way here, where I'm saying that the coefficient of thermal conductivity times the area times the temperature gradient through substance 1 is equal to the coefficient of thermal conductivity times the area times the temperature gradient through substance 2. And one of the things that I can do here is recall that I actually am trying to calculate the rate per area, so divide this by A on both sides, and that gets rid of my expression per, or my area on both sides of the equation. And so that makes my life a little bit simpler. But I want to get the overall heat flow. So what I need to do, I do, I know K1 and I know X1 and I know all that stuff, but I don't know the temperature gradient because I don't know the temperature in the middle, you know, in other, in, in other words, directly between the ice and the wood. And I need to be able to know, I need to be able to calculate that so that I can solve this problem. So what I'm going to do is write this, pro, uh, write this down in a slightly different way. So since it's a material that has a constant thermal uh, conductivity throughout it, wood, the wood or the ice, I should say, what I can do is rewrite my dt dx as a delta, delta t over delta x. And in this case, I know what my delta x's are. I know that the wood is 10 centimeters thick, and I know that the ice is 1 centimeter thick. And I can also say I know what the temperature change is, because there is some temperature in between these that I'm going to call t sub m, and t sub m is just going to be uh, the temp in the middle. And specifically, I mean uh, the temperature at the interface. So we're going to go at, at interface right there. So that's my shorthand for that. Remember, temperature in the middle or the temperature at the interface. And so what I can do then is write this expression of K1 delta T1 over delta X1 as K1 times T in minus Tm, so that's the temperature inside the house, 
minus the intermediate temperature divided by delta x1. And then this has to be equal to K2 times delta T2. So it's the temperature in the middle minus the outer temperature divided by delta x2. And so if you'll note, I'm, this is T in minus Tm, and this is Tm minus T out. And I'm, I've written it specifically in this way because uh, the inner temperature is hot, the outer temperature is cold. This temperature ought to be uh, intermediate between them somewhere. I'm not sure exactly where yet, and I'll find out. But uh, you have to write them in the correct order, otherwise you'll get the uh, expression backwards. And so you need to make sure that you're going from, you know, consistently left to right, because or right to left in this case. So this is the rightmost in our picture, second most, and then T out is the third most. And so now what we're going to do is reshuffle some of our terms. So we'll move up here, and I'm going to move all of the T sub M's to the right-hand side, and I'm going to move all of the stuff, uh, the other things that we know, to the left-hand side. And I'm going to say that K1 T in over delta X1 plus K2 T out over delta X2 is equal to K1 T middle, T sub M, over delta X1 plus K2 Tm over delta X2. And the uh, one point to take away is that for the temperatures here, we're getting to the point where we can actually plug in numbers, that it doesn't matter whether we use Celsius or Kelvin because we're looking at the differences between things. And it'll all average out in the end. So if I, re, uh, if I solve for T sub M, I'm going to get an expression that I'm just going to go ahead and write down. And there we go. And I got this by factoring T sub M out of these two expressions and then dividing both the left-hand side and the right-hand side by that. And so what I see is that there's the inner temperature and the outer temperature and then a bunch of um, incidences of K1 and X1. And so now what I can do is plug in all of the quantities that I already know, that I have from the problem. And so here I've written down all of the numbers that come out of the uh, original problem statement. And the, remember, the things to remember are the thermal conductivity of wood is 0.2 watts per meter Kelvin, which is quite low. The thickness of the wood is 10 centimeters, or really 0.1 meters. Um, for the ice, the thermal conductivity is 2 watts per meter Kelvin, which is much higher. The thickness is one centimeter, much lower. And then what we see is the inner temperature is 25 Celsius and the outer temperature is 10 Celsius. And so now if we plug all of these numbers in, we see that the temperature uh, at the mid is equal to minus 9.65 Celsius. And so this makes sense because ice conducts very well. Also, there's a thin layer. And so, you know, recall that dq dt is equal to k times a times dt dx. And so for ice, k is much higher, and dt dx is going to be very steep. So it's going to, very, it's going to transmit heat very well. And so you would expect that just inside of the layer of the ice, or between the ice and the wood, temperature ought to be much closer to the outside than it is to the inside of the house, and that's true. So it's only 0.35 degrees away from our outside temperature of minus 10 C. So now what we can do is knowing our temperature at that interface, we can go ahead and calculate the heat transport per area. And the heat transport per area is just dq dt divided by the area. And so I know that the heat transport through the wood is the same as the heat transport through the ice. So I can just solve it for one. So I can just say that dq1 dt divided by the area is just going to be what I'm looking for. And so that is k1 delta t1 over delta x1. And so this is going to be k1 times t in, which is 25 Celsius, minus t in the middle, the temperature at the interface, which is minus 9.65 Celsius, divided by delta X1, which is 10 centimeters or 0.1 meters. And so when we plug these numbers in, we see that D2 
dq dt divided by the area is just going to be 69.31 watts per square meter. And so that is, uh, and that's what we're going to get for this. Thank you very much.